Well, my name is Denise Side, and I'm the author of Uncovering the Logic of English. Welcome to the presentation tonight. I wonder how many of you, um, when you saw the poster, The Logic of English, thought, isn't that an oxymoron? Most people hear the terms English and logic in one sentence, and they say, well, English is illogical. And the reason that we say that is because most of us have been taught to read through sight words, such as the books like Dick and Jane. The method, the method that was um, used in this era was they would hold up a sign that says C and one that says Dick, and then the children would say, see, Dick. And they'd say, look, you're reading. And children would then need to memorize each individual word by sight. We still do that today as a combination, and it's often used with the Dolch list. Another approach that has come along that's created some confusion is whole language. And I want to be clear, there's some beautiful, wonderful things about the whole language approach. It's led to a proliferation of children's literature and beautiful books. And it's true, we must read to children, and reading to them helps to develop their language skills. However, there's a great myth out there in our culture, and that's that children learn to read by being read to. And that's simply not true. About a third of the students will learn to read you know, no matter how we teach them, but about two-thirds of our nation's students are struggling and they need a systematic approach. Another reason that students struggle with reading and with spelling is what I call funny phonics. And what I mean by funny phonics is they're rules that have more exceptions than rule followers. So most people, when they think of the rules of English, they immediately come up with all the exceptions. So here's one example. How many of you have heard of the spelling rule, when, or the reading rule, when two vowels go walking, the first one does the talking? Have any of you heard of that? Well, let's look at a few words. Bread, it works with bread. How about bead? Maybe. And then we have great. Well, this is immediately an exception. With EI, we have ceiling. And then we have the word there. Now that vowel sound A is not even seen in the E or the I. So when we teach these sort of funny phonics rules, we create the myth that we've taught children all there is to know about English, and they become discouraged by all those exceptions. Well, in my book, Uncovering the Logic of English, there are 104 tools. There are phonograms and spelling rules that explain 98% of English words. Well, the first question I'm always asked is, aren't 104 tools a lot for students to learn? Isn't it too difficult for them? Well, I like to ask you to put this into perspective. How many words are in the English lexicon today? Do you have any guesses? Well, there are a million words and growing. By some counts, there are two million words and growing. So I ask you, 104 tools or a million words? In addition, the average adult knows between 40 and 60,000 words in their working vocabulary. A well-educated adult knows up to 200,000 words. So 74 phonograms and 30 spelling rules explain 98% of English words. What is more efficient, to memorize those 200 individual words or to know the 104 tools that explain them? So one of the reasons, as I mentioned before, that there's confusion is that we teach kids kind of an oversimplified way of understanding English. How many letters are there in the English alphabet? We all began by learning um, to read by learning our ABCs. So how many letters are there? There's 26. How many sounds are there in the English language? There are actually 45. And if we're going to teach how to decode the English language, it'd be very important to know how each of those 45 sounds are written. And you can see that there's immediately a discrepancy between our alphabet and the sounds of English. English is actually a very complex code. It's one of the most complex written codes. Um, I would probably argue that Chinese is more difficult than English. But we have 45 sounds represented by 74 basic phonograms. 48 of our phonograms are multi-letter phonograms. That means there's more than one letter working together to say the sound. A very simple example of this is the word boy. The oi sound is spelled O-Y. We also have 23 phonograms which make more than one sound. Now, many people get kind of depressed when they hear about how complex the English code is. But we need to remember, first of all, 
all languages have points of difficulty, points that are more challenging them in them than, in, than other languages. For example, one good thing about English is it has a very simple grammatical system. Many languages have a lot of inflections where you add endings and a lot more difficulty to their grammatical system. English, though, has a complex phonetic system. But our code allows us to be more creative. There's all sorts of plays on words we can make. It's more flexible. In addition, this enormous language, um, the enormous vocabulary of English, means that we have more synonyms in English than in any other language in the world. It's also excellent for technical writing, maybe one of the best languages in the world because of its ability to be very precise and our ability to import words when we need them for new concepts. So it is a very strong and powerful tool. And part of my mission is to change how we think about English from being discouraged about it to appreciating the power of our complex code as we teach our students. Well, how do we teach such a massive subject? It's important that we begin by focusing on the most necessary components. As we mentioned, those 74 phonograms and 30 spelling rules. But in addition, 1,000 words describe 65% of all that we read and write. So whether you're reading a simple children's book or a doctoral thesis, the same words are going to show up. These are our basic grammatical words. Have, has, had, do, does, did, he, she, it. They are in every form of writing, whether it's a simple piece of writing or a difficult piece of writing. So we need to begin by teaching students those terms that will show up in all writing, those 1,000 terms that describe 65% of all that we read and write. All right, I've been mentioning the word phonogram, but what is a phonogram? A phonogram is actually a sound picture. And so often, um, like I said, we teach only letters. But it's time that we begin to think of these, rather than just as letters, as pictures of sounds. When we teach phonograms, it's very important that we begin by teaching all of their sounds. So often we pair a letter with a picture, such as an apple, and that gives the child the impression that A always says A ah, as an apple. However, A actually says three sounds. It says A as an apple, a is an age, and A is in water. So when we teach students, it would be better to show them the picture of the sound and without an additional help that creates confusion. We also should begin with lowercase letters. So often we begin by teaching students the uppercase letters first. But what do we use uppercase letters for in English? Proper nouns and the beginning of the sentence. 95, 98% of all that we read and write is lowercase letters. And yes, they need to learn the uppercase letters, but they should learn them second. In addition, we should begin by teaching the sounds, not the letter names. We usually teach children that the letters to spell dog are D-O-G, but this does not help them read the word dog. If they were instead to learn d a g they would have all that they needed to decode the word dog. Now, I'm not saying it's not important to teach letter names. It is, but it shouldn't be emphasized as the first thing. You know, culturally, we need to teach them. I have a funny story about one of my young students going to the eye doctor and reading the big E as E, -E and the eye doctor was a little bit surprised. So culturally, we need this information, and it is helpful for transmitting um, spellings of names and words efficiently through speech. Also, we need to teach all the sounds for each phonogram. And here's just one of my favorite examples. It's what do, what do most people know this letter is saying? S. So it says as in sand, sick, list, and hiss. However, what about these words? Is, his, was, and resent. Often when we teach children that is only says the s sound, many students will misread these words as is, hiss, was, and on and on. And if they're little logical students, they will do this again and again and again. Other students are able to handle when you say, oh, I'm sorry, that's is, not is. That's an exception, and they go on. What does this say? Most of us have been taught that this says ch, as in chin and chapel. And for most of my life, school was a complete exception, as well as orchid and Christmas. But CH actually says three sounds. It says ch, k, and here it says sh, as in chef, machine, in Chicago. 
These are all actually French-based words. So when you hear students at like the script spelling bee asking for the origins of words, when they hear the sh sound and they know that it's a French word, they know it's spelled with a CH. So we need to teach a complete picture. Now this is very important. I have a theory that there are two types of learners out there. This is different from learning styles, but just as I've observed students learning to read and learning to spell, there are logical, literal students. These are our nation's future engineers, our mathematicians, and these students are very bright. When you tell them that S says S, they go ahead and they apply that again and again and again to each word that they see. And if it says is instead, if it's saying this is a sound, they're very confused and they're bothered by that discrepancy. And unfortunately, they'll read is as is as is again and again. And oftentimes they begin to internalize that there's something wrong with them because they're not getting it. All we need to do to help those students is teach them both sounds. And then they have all the information they need to decode those words. On the other hand, there's students who are very intuitive. Now these students do not notice the difference. If you take a moment and say s and z, what's the same between these sounds? S, z. You'll notice the shape of your mouth is exactly the same, but what's different? In the z sound, your voice box is on, and otherwise, s, your voice is not on. So these are a voiced and unvoiced pair. The intuitive students, my theory is that when you say, oh, that's is, they never noticed that s and z are different sounds. Now, intuitive students have a gift, and that's a strength in learning. However, those logical, literal students also have a strength, and we need to teach in a way that respects them. We also need to teach using multisensory activities. So often we think of reading as only a visual activity. We think of seeing the letters or the phonograms and recognizing their shapes, and we rely only on that. In fact, most people in our culture, when I ask them, are you a good speller, and they say yes, I'll ask them, well, how do you know how to spell well? And they'll say, well, I have to write it down, or I have to see it. They have the gift of having a strong visual memory. They're able to memorize words visually. If you ask people, though, if they're not a good speller, most of those people are not able to memorize those visual patterns. They may be auditory or kinesthetic learners. So we need to also teach to their strengths. Now, reading has an auditory component, and it's very important that we link the auditory component of reading to um, the print, and that is speaking. All of those letters are representing sounds. So our auditory learners have a really great benefit when we teach very explicitly that this is a picture of a sound, and that also helps our um, visual students as well. Finally, we have kinesthetic students. Those students learn through moving. So often, these students are completely left out when we teach them how to read. But reading has two kinesthetic components. It has the kinesthetic component of writing and learning how to shape those letters. In fact, there's wonderful research out of the university um, in Norway and in France that shows that when students are taught how to write the letters, they're experiencing them kinesthetically and they remember them better and with fewer reversals than if they are taught only to recognize them visually alone or through the sounds. And so there's fabulous research that's showing that all of our students will benefit when they learn using both hearing, seeing, and shaping the letters through doing. So when we teach, we also need to teach parts to whole. Now, this is how babies learn to speak. Babies, when they're small, babble all the known sounds in, all the hum in human languages. So some of those really strange sounds they're making are from other languages. But as they listen to that, the language that's being spoken around them, they hone it down to the individual sounds of the mother tongue being spoken around them. They then begin to babble syllables, ma, pa, me, and eventually two-syllable words and short sentences, such as more juice in me cup. Now, babies do not go from babbling to speaking in sentences, do they? They follow a very systematic process. In the same way, when we teach reading, we need to teach systematically from the parts to the whole. We need to learn the individual phonograms and their sounds and what those sound like. We need to teach them what they look like and how they sound. We need to then build the phonograms together into one-syllable words and then into two-syllable words and short sentences. 
Now, longer words, uh, longer words and more complex sentences. All right, so now we're going to learn A through Z together. Many of the sounds will be familiar to you probably. However, I think it's always helpful to see all of the sounds. All right, this is A, A, A. And if you'd like to repeat the sounds after me, that would be helpful. A, A, A. A, A, B. K, S. D. E. F, E. F, G, J. I, I, y. Many people are puzzled by the yes sound, but think of the word onion. J. K. O. M. N. A, O, U. P. Qua. R. S. Z. A U U A V W X Y E I E Z. All right. Now, most of us have been taught in our elementary school education what is a vowel. So, what are the vowels? A, E, I, O, U, and sometimes Y. But do you have any idea what a vowel is or why it matters? <laughs> Most of us do not. So a vowel is a sound that can be sustained, such as in singing, and the mouth is opened. So vowels can also be made louder and softer. And kids love this because if you take the vowel out of the word help, you can't call for help very loudly. Hope, hope. <laughs> Consonants are sounds where the sound is blocked somehow by the mouth, whether by the lips or by the tongue. And vowels cannot be sustained, they cannot be sung, and they cannot be controlled for volume. So let's go ahead and discover for a moment our consonants and vowels. Too often we teach children just to memorize by rote without really understanding what they're doing. So how about this one, a, a, a. How about the first sound, a, 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 a. Is it a consonant or a vowel? Vowel, a, a, a. Vowel, because we can sing it. Ah, uh -huh. vowel, because we can sing it. Our mouth is open. How about b? B. It's a consonant because our, something is blocking it, our lips. And helping children engage to know what's blocking the sound helps them to discover if it's a consonant or vowel. K. Consonant. Consonant because it's being blocked. Now, most people have memorized that ya, i, or the y is sometimes a consonant and sometimes a vowel. Well, let's test it. Ya. Yeah. Ya. Yeah. Is that a consonant or a vowel sound? Consonant because something's blocking it and we can't sing it. How about i? I, I, I. It's a vowel because we can sing it. I, I, I. We can sing it. So it is a vowel sound. And knowing the difference between a consonant and a vowel is very important for spelling and for reading purposes, as I'll show you in a bit. Before we do that, though, I'd like to teach you your first spelling rule. And that is, English words do not end in I, U, V, or J. So let's say that together. English words do not end in I, U, V, or J. All right, we'll immediately see how this is relevant as we learn a few multi-letter phonograms. So this is oi, oi, and this is oi. All right, which one may I use at the end of English words? A y, y, because this one ends in an i, and English words do not end in i. How about this? This says a, and this says a. Which one may I not use at the end? A, i. Why not? English words do not end in i. Here we have ow, o, and ow, o, u, u. Ow, o, u, u. All right, what's the same between ow, o, and ow, o, u, u? Well, they share two sounds, ow and o. They both start with an o. And which one may I use in the, at the end of the word? O, w. Why may I not use this at the end? English words do not end in I, U, V, or J. There are many pairs in our language, and there's much complexity towards what's going on. But once you begin to see the patterns, it's really not as complex as you might think. All right, this is er, the er of her. 
and ch, k, sh. Go ahead. Ch, k, sh. And we'll bring these back in a few moments. So what is the most common reason for a long vowel sound in English? Go ahead. The most common answer I get is because of a silent final E. In fact, that is the only reason most English speakers know for a long vowel sound, but it is not the most common reason. The most common reason for a silent final E I'll let you discover, because I believe that teaching through discovery helps students to remember the information much better. So I like to show them words, but then to provide them the support as they figure it out so they cannot fail. So what's happening here? We have bag and bagel, bend and be, tot and total, hum and human. When is the vowel saying its long sound? Yeah, at the end of the syllable. So the most common reason for the vowels A, E, O, U to say their long sound is at the end of the syllable. And the spelling rule says A, E, O, U usually say their names at the end of the syllable. All right. I want to show you the rule that really got me excited. <laughs> so it might sound funny, but do you remember the C? It has two sounds. It says k and s. And there's actually a rule that will tell us when it will say each of its sounds. So when is C saying its soft sounds in these words, scent, center, cell, absence, and space? When is it saying s before a e? When is it saying it soft sounds in cider, circus, cinema, exercise, recital? Before an I. And how about in these words, cylinder, cycle, cypress? Before a Y. So C always softens to S when followed by an E, I, or Y. What does it say before an A? O or U? K. How about before a consonant? K. And how about at the end of the word? So the full rule reads, C always softens to S when followed by an E, I, or Y. Otherwise, C says K. Now, many people will use the word circus to say, isn't English crazy and illogical? But as you look at the word now, why does the first C say S? Because it's before an I. And the second one says it's hard sound K because it's before a U. In fact, all Latin words, Latin roots in English, will follow this rule. There are more than six thousand words alone where C softens to the sound before an E, I, or Y. You would think this would have been essential to us learning, wouldn't you? Especially when many of these words are multi-syllable words. These are the words that many students begin to struggle with as they develop in their reading skills because they have more syllables and there's more going on in them. But as soon as you see that pattern, it really opens up the language. In addition, all Latin-based um, languages follow this rule. So this rule is prevalent in Italian and in other Latin languages as well. When we begin to learn the rules of English, it helps us to learn other foreign languages. And even if they're not Latin-based, we begin to learn the concept that sometimes um, consonants or vowels will change their sounds based on the letters they're in proximity to. In English, though, we've often said these words are exceptions. Do you think they're exceptions? Not in the least. All right, let's go on to the silent final E, one of my other favorite concepts. So most of us have been taught the vowel sound changes because of the E. So we know that cap becomes cape and pet peat and rip ripe. And this is a good rule to know. However, it only explains 50% of silent final E's. So what happens is you have young students misreading have as have, give as give, and on and on and on. Well, maybe you can tell me why the E is there after we've talked about it, the rule that we learned earlier. English words do not end in I, U, V, or J. So the reason the silent final E is in these words is English words don't end in V. So when a student misreads have, you're now able to say to them, I'm sorry, the E is there because of the V. They have a logical reason that they can understand. It's no longer just an exception. How about in true blue value, why is the E here? English words do not end in U. Whenever that U sound is at the end, we need a silent final E. This also helps, obviously, with spelling. Wouldn't it have been much simpler to learn that in first grade than to memorize all these words individually? So the rule is English words do not end in V or U. 
Okay, why do we have a silent final E in these words? Choice, commerce, force, absence, and voice. Yeah, the C softens to S before an E. What would it say without the E? Choik, do you see it now? So the third rule for a silent final E is the C says because of the E. Now these are only three of the nine reasons for a silent final E as shown in uncovering the logic of English. However, we need to understand that these rules have even more significance because we need to know why the E was present before we know if we can drop it. Most of us were taught oversimplifications in this area as well too. Now I was taught drop the E when adding ING. Anyone else? Very bad rule, not very helpful, unless you're adding ing, but <laughs> what about ed? What about able? Other people were taught drop the e when adding a vowel suffix. This is a better rule, however, we have some problems. All right, so if we add ing to like, we get liking. If we add, uh, we drop the e in like to make likable. We drop the e in notice to make noticing. Why do we not drop the e in noticeable? Because what would it say? Do you see it now? It would say noticable because C softens to s only before an E, I, or Y. Is this an exception? I think it's an interplay of the rules. And when I began to see this, I thought it was rather beautiful to see the complexity of the rules coming together. But I didn't notice this without someone pointing it out to me. All right, service, servicing. But do we drop the E in serviceable? No, because it would say cervicable. This also explains words like picnicking. Why do we need to add a K to make picnicking? Otherwise, it would say picnic sing. And this happens with mimicking. But English is more consistent than we might think because critic and we add ism, why do we not add a K? Because the C softens to criticism in its pronunciation. All right, another area of often confusion is that most people learned the ending T-I-O-N. Anyone? But this oversimplification creates confusion, doesn't it? <laughs> Unnecessarily. In English, there are really three Latin spellings for the sound sh. Now, I'm not advocating teaching Latin, but we need to understand that 90% of our multisyllable words come from Latin, and so they have some Latin um, characteristics to them. Now, there is a way, though, to help students know which Latin spelling of sh is going to be heard in those words. What do you notice here? You have express, expression. Why did I use an S-I in expression and not a T-I-O-N? Because express ended with an S. Face becomes facial. Do you see the pattern? The C then forms the Latin spelling of sh in facial. Space, spacious. Inspect, inspection. Locate, location. So there's often a pattern that you can see. To teach students to spell these words, we need to teach them to go back to the root. Sometimes the Latin root is not obvious in English. It's not an English root. So this trick doesn't work for all words. However, it works for most of them. And students know then that they will have to choose T-I, S-I, or C-I as one of those spellings at the beginning of the syllable in the middle of the word. All right. Let's put to work some of what we've been learning. If you have a pen and paper, you can pull it out, but we're going to write a few words and see if we see them any differently. Let's begin with the word, a very simple word, boy. So let's sound it out, b, oi. And what kind of oi are you going to use while you write it? Oi that you may use at the end of English words. So go ahead and write it, and then let's sound it out together, b, oi. And well, I like to teach students to underline that oi because it helps them to learn to group those letters together as making and representing one phonogram sound. Now this has revolutionized how I see words. I have a confession to make. Even though I was an English teacher and my graduate work is in, was in teaching English as a second language, I was a terrible speller. In fact, I so struggled with spelling that many times I abandoned the perfect word while writing because spell check couldn't recognize it. And no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't get spell check to recognize my attempt. 
What's amazing about that experience is that's very wide, uh, a very common experience in our culture. I recently spoke at an educators conference where there were more than 100 teachers in the room, and I asked them, how many of you have had this experience? And over 90% of the room raised their hands. There's something really wrong with how we're teaching English because even our teachers don't understand it well enough, and it's not their fault. You can't teach what you don't know. But I think it's time that we revolutionize how we're teaching it so that students learn. So I, help, I have students underline those multi-letter phonograms to train their eye to see them as a unit. All right, let's write our next word. It'll be paper. How many syllables in paper? Pay, per. Two syllables. The first syllable is pay, p, a, and the second syllable is per, p, er, and you'll use the er of her. So you can go ahead and write it, and then let's sound it out together. A, p, er. All right, why did the A say it's long sound? Because it's at the end of the syllable. And A, E, O, U usually say their names at the end of the syllable. And then we have the spelling of er. Well, let's contrast this with the word pepper. How many syllables in pepper? Pep, per, two syllables. And go ahead and you can write it, and then we'll sound it out together. All right? E, p, p, er. All right, so this says pepper. We doubled the P because otherwise the, p, the E would be at the end of the syllable and it would say peeper. Oftentimes we double consonants to close that syllable so that the vowel says it's short sound. Those short sounds are usually heard before double consonants. Oops, I gave you a peek. Now, this is one of the words <laughs> that is most commonly misspelled by adults. And I'd like us to take a moment and to sound it out together. It's miscellaneous. So this is one of those words that, you know, even well-educated adults often don't spell well. So let's think about this for a moment. How many syllables in miss, sell, lay, ni, us? Five. All right, let's sound out the first syllable, miss. M, I, s. You're going to use a s, s here. Then you have cell, s. You're going to use a k s here, e, o. Then lay, o, a, ni, n, e, and us, a, s. And when my students are new and they maybe don't remember a phonogram, I will even show it to them. It's this a uh, sound, <laughs> this spelling of a. Uh. Let's look at it together. Miscellaneous. This word used to look to me like an M-I-S and an S on the end, and everything in the middle was just kind of letters. And I used to learn my spelling words, M-I-S-C-E-L-L-A. <laughs> Do you know what I'm talking about? That's how most of us learned how to spell. But why does the C say S in this word? Because it's before an E. Why did the A say A? Because it's at the end of the syllable. Why did the E say E? because it's at the end of the syllable. And why did the OU say uh? Because it's a phonogram working together. There's actually a reason for every letter within words. To me, it used to be rote memorization and just an attempt to try to grasp this without any sense to it. And that's okay if you're a strong visual learner. It's okay if you're a strong intuitive learner. But those logical students, those logical literal minds, they really stumble over this because they're trying to apply what they've been taught systematically. Now, I have some advice if you have students who struggle with reading about guarding your students' hearts. So often, what do we do? We tell students, it's time to learn to read. And we get out a book and we sit down and we expect them to read to us. And I call this torture reading. It's torture for the student and it's torture for the person listening to them because they don't know what they're doing. They're doing a lot of guessing, and oftentimes they get very discouraged, and those students start to internalize either English is stupid, I hate English, or I'm stupid, right? And so what's better is to step back, give them a break from reading if they're struggling, reading texts, and begin to teach them the 104 tools that describe the words that they need to learn to read, and then come back to texts. Then you can even underline those multi-letter phonograms, or when they misread something with a silent final E, you can go, oh, why is the E there? And they'll be able to then pull out reasons and not just be randomly guessing. Now, I believe this is really an important message, and here's why. This is the fourth grade literacy rates in the United States today. 
If you just take a moment to absorb this, 34% of our fourth graders cannot read. 34% are struggling, and 32% of our students read well. This is according to the National Reading Pan Panel. So about a third of our students um, read well, and the other two thirds are struggling. The situation does not improve a great deal in eighth grade. Notice we have a few more students reading, but more students struggling. When we do not teach English systematically, we are leaving about two thirds of our nation behind. And though we talk a great deal about STEM education right now, and though I believe firmly that math and science education is vital to our new economy, it is vital that we raise up mathematicians and scientists, we are leaving them behind in first grade, second grade, third grade, and they can't read. And you cannot build on the foundation academically of a student who's struggling with basic literacy skills. So, I believe that it's time that we um, address this as a nation. Now, notice the adult literacy rates. This is a different exam. So there are five levels instead of three, according to the National Adult, adult Literacy Survey. But what you discover is that a full 49% of adults read at the lowest levels of literacy. And only 3% of adults read at the highest levels of literacy. We need to reverse that. And there's hope. <laughs> and that's, I think, one of the things that has motivated me the most. So this chart I took from Dr. Reed Lyon in a presentation that I heard him give a few months ago. Dr. Reed Lyon is the former head of the National Institute of Health and Child Development. He has endorsed Uncovering the Logic of English. He um, is one of the foremost experts in our nation on reading education. Our federal government has spent billions of dollars on reading research, and what it has shown is that we know how to teach reading, and teaching reading to children systematically how the language works result, uh, results in amazing things. If you'll notice, on the first column, it's the name of the researcher. The second column is the number of hours that those students were taught, then the student-teacher ratio, then this is what's really astounding. The number of students below the 40th, 30th percentile before instruction and the final column, the number of students below the 30th percentile after instruction. What you discover is with about 80 hours of instruction, you can bring almost all students up above the 30th percentile. You can bring them to the point of reading. What's even more amazing, and Dr. Reed Lyon is part of this research as well as Sally Shalewitz um, at Yale, is that they are able to do functional MRI studies of students while they're reading. If you are a struggling reader, you will be using the front right side of your brain. If you are a strong reader, you will be using the back left side of your brain. And what they have shown is that with that 80 hours of instruction, not only can they bring students' reading levels up, but their brain patterns reflect that they have become strong readers. So, I ask you um, tonight, you know, so many times we think of this as the student's issue, it's a reading disability, and yes, I believe that's real for some people, but it's not real for two-thirds of our nation, and not when we can change it through sound instruction. So the differences between strong readers and struggling readers have nothing to do with intelligence. In fact, I firmly believe that some of our brightest math and science minds are the ones we're leaving behind because we're not teaching in a way that respects how they learn. And what we have found is that we can rewire the brain for language and for understanding print simply through teaching and as little as 80 hours of teaching. So I ask you tonight to join me in ensuring that all of our children learn to read. It's not that hard. Is 80 hours a lot? It's really not in the scope of their education. And we can do this by telling your neighbors, telling your coworkers, um, sharing, uncovering the logic of English with teachers. And I ask you if you do that to not be negative. Teachers often don't know this information. Those teachers in our classrooms care about their kids. They're really wrestling with the fact that a third of their students are struggling or two thirds of their students are struggling. They want answers as much as the rest of us. So if you bring them um, uncovering, bring it with a sense of, this made sense to me, what do you think? Bring it with a positive sense of hope. Um, reach out, teach a child to read, reach out, work at a literacy center, or organize an event in your community or at your local school to raise awareness about literacy. I want you to understand 
how much hope literacy brings to people. Not only is our economy dependent upon it, but individuals are. 80% of juvenile delinquents are illiterate. When you teach those students or those inmates to read, 17% of them will recommit. If you don't teach them to read, more than 70% of them will. So often when I'm interviewed, I'm asked, aren't, isn't the problem that our students are apathetic? They don't want to learn. I really believe the problem is that if they struggle with the most foundational skill in their education in first grade, in second grade, in third grade, and in fourth grade, they start to internalize there's something wrong, they're not smart, and they start to check out. Not because they're not bright, but because they're not getting it. And I think we can reverse this together, but it takes a grassroots effort. It takes people working together in their communities. We've tried to pass um, legislation from a federal level, from state levels. It doesn't work. It's going to take neighbors reaching out to neighbors, um, family members reaching out to family members, and just passing it on. So if this presentation made sense to you, tell someone about it and try to change um, literacy in your communities.